have your Bibles today, you'd open them to Genesis chapter 22. Beginning at verse 1, Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. I'm speaking to us today on the, on the topic of all that matters. All that matters. Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1, the King James reads, as we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell, of, tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go up, uh, go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Notice what Abraham says. I and the lad are going to go up and come back. He wasn't expecting that child to die. Amen. One way or the other, Abraham knew that boy was not going to be left on the mountain. He says, we'll be back. And it goes on to say, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And Abraham, uh, and they, and, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine ha uh, hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. I want to stop for a second here real quick. And I want to point out to you, notice in verse 11 it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven. When you read the term, the angel of the Lord, this generally speaks of the Lord himself. This is a, it's another way in Hebrew language, this is a way in which they would say the spirit of the Lord. But they would say the angel because angel and spirit are synonymous. Okay? So this is God himself speaking, but listen to the way God speaks. He said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. So he speaks of himself in the third person. He's not, you know, he's not speaking in the first person. He doesn't say, For now I know that you fear me. You see what I'm saying? So I'm only saying this for those that are of the Trinitarian mindset and cannot understand how Jesus could speak in the third person at times or how he could speak, you know, uh, in such a manner that one might get the impression that he's speaking of a different person. No, he wasn't speaking of a different person any more than God was speaking of a different God in this instance. Then he goes on to say, for I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. In the stead of his son. Do you remember me preaching worthy, talking about a sacrifice, is in the stead of not... It has nothing to do with that sacrifice is not, 
you can't do what that sacrifice can do. So therefore, something is offered instead. If I ask you, would you like a piece of cake? And you say to me, no, I'm really not crazy about cake. And I say, well, how about a cookie instead? What I'm offering you is something that would do the job that the other thing couldn't do. So therefore, the lamb was to be in Isaac's stead. He said, uh, and Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. That's uh, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. Master, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you, God, for your word. Lord, as we're about to embark upon this message that you've laid in my heart, I ask you, God, to allow your anointing to rest upon your messenger. Help us, God, to deliver this word faithfully, truly, that the people of God might be blessed and encouraged and help this hour. Lord, just challenge us, we pray, to greater heights and deeper depths than you, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. All that matters... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a very simple, basic point out of our primary text this morning. For that whole story, I could go through and do a verse-by-verse -verse exegesis and break it down, but we're not going to do that this morning because I want to talk to us today about all that matters, what's really important, what really counts with God, what really scores points, as it were, in heaven. And I want to pull one simple point, one primary point out of our primary text today. Twice it is mentioned. Twice it is stated. In verse number 2, God tells Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And then when the... The time comes that Abraham's prepared to make the sacrifice, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back further. And the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now what did you just hear twice? Thine only son. Twice God referred, twice God referred, not Abraham, God referred to Isaac twice as thine only son. But he wasn't Abraham's only son. Ishmael had been born before Isaac was even conceived. So therefore, Abraham had another son. But he wasn't the son that God had planned for Abraham. There are a lot of things we do in our lives that may be good, that may be positive, that may be nice, but it's not what God planned for our life. And all that matters to God is what He has planned for you and I. God doesn't give two happy hallelujahs about all the nice things we can do. He doesn't care about all the positive things that we attempt and endeavor to do. What God cares about is that we walk and live in His will and do the things that He's asked us to do. God is interested in faith. God is interested in obedience. God is not interested in anything outside of those realms. Amen. I think if, if there's any teaching that has ever come into the church that is a heresy and a falsehood, it is the concept that God has a perfect will and God has a permissive will or a passive will. Baloney. God has a perfect will for our lives, and we have the option of either walking in it or walking outside of it. And part of our service toward the king, part of our service as Christians, is to seek to constantly always be in the perfect will of God. That's what being a Christian is all about. That's what we're supposed to be desiring and seeking to do every day of our lives. God, I don't ever want to be outside of your will. The Bible said he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. He leads me in the right path. 
the path of righteousness, in the right path. That's what it's saying. He leads me in the right path. Well, if he leads me in the right path, what path will I be on if I'm not on the right path? I'll be on the wrong path. Amen. There are a lot of people this morning who are not walking in the will of God, who are not listening to the leading of the Holy Ghost. They're trying to live their lives by their own, uh, by the seat of their own pants and doing things their own way, and they're not allowing God to lead them and guide them in the right path for them. Amen. There are many in this life who will seek to take the easiest path instead. We often refer to it as the path of least, least resistance. They do what they know they can do, and they do it in a way that they know they can do it. But they ignore the promises and provisions of God along the way. Some will say, I'd rather do it the easy way myself than do it the hard way with God. Amen. There are folks that have that mentality. You see, there might be a million places this morning that I could go to and start a new work, and we might have a hundred people in service in a matter of a day or in a matter of a month or in a matter of a year. But you know what? That's not where I believe with all my heart God wants me to be. I am where God wants me to be. So even if this journey is more difficult, it is the place I need to be. Amen? We need to be where God wants us to be. We need to be where God has called us to be because there can be no miracle without faith. Amen. There can be no miracle when this thing finally busts loose and when the miracle re finally comes and a church is born in this community that will draw the attention of an entire nation. Then, my friend, it will be because a few of us have enough faith to hang in during the hard time and to believe God in spite of every circumstance, in spite of every situation, even though Sarah's womb appears dead, I still choose to believe God. He will give me a son. But not with Hagar, with Sarah. Because God said I'd have a son with Sarah. My Lord, have mercy. In Genesis 17, which is a few chapters prior to our primary text this morning, we read verses 1 through 6, and when Abram was 90 years old and 9, meaning 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be the father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Notice the Lord is speaking in the past tense. He said, I've already done it. Amen. When God says it, it's as good as done. Amen. The minute it comes off his lips, it's finished, it's done, it's over with. Too bad Abraham didn't understand that as well as he could. We could be today without all those Arabs over in the Middle East causing all kinds of grief and trouble and surrounding Israel with all kinds of violence and trouble. We could be without that this morning if only Father Abraham had understood when God says it, it's guaranteed. Not only is it guaranteed, but it's done, because it passed his lips. And the Lord said, And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. You notice he said nations, not nation. He said, I shall make nations out of thee. That was a foretelling of the promise that the gospel would be brought also to the Gentile nations, that it would not only be a Jewish gospel. It would not be a message only for the Hebrew people. Listen to what the Lord goes on to say. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sariah, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. 
Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? God's covenant with Abraham was made right after Ishmael had already been born. But God, still God's covenant didn't include what Abraham had done of himself in the flesh. In other words, it didn't include Ishmael. But rather only that which God himself was about to do. The Bible said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. There are people out there today in our uh, community who have all kinds of ministries and all kinds of churches, and they're doing all kinds of things, and some of them are being met with a reasonable level of success. And yet, if God is not there building, then honey, your labor is in vain. If you are not operating in the perfect plan and will of God, then your labor is in vain. Because all that matters to God is what God is doing. Not what we do for him or on his behalf or what we do in unbelief because we go where we know we can be successful. We go where we know we are, uh, have the resources to do the job. We go where we know we have the money. We go, you know, some of the preachers this morning that are building churches have jobs that pay wonderful salaries and they get great benefits and they've been there for years. Well, honey, it isn't that hard to build a church when you got a great salary and all these benefits. But Jesus said, when you go, he said, take neither script nor purse. Don't take any gold. Don't take any silver. He said, when you go into a city to preach the gospel, you go in broke. Because if that city is deserving of a church that preaches this message and declares this wonderful name, then that city is going to have to have people who are willing to support it. And if it doesn't, then you need to move on. But you know what, Tommy, there are preachers this morning with their big salaries in the community they've been living in for the last 15 years, and they own their own home there, and they've got their big job, and they make their big money, and they decide, well, this is where I'm going to build a church. Well, of course, it's a whole lot easier that way. It's a whole lot easier to believe that... Hagar can have a child than it is to believe that Sarah can. It's a whole lot easier to believe you can build a church where you've got a good job and a good salary and a nice house than it is to believe if God called you to get up and go somewhere you've never been, where you haven't got nothing, no job, no money, no house. Let's see you build a church then. Well, see, that takes faith. And that's what too many in our Christian community today do not have. They're not operating in faith. They're not acting in faith. They're operating and they're acting in the flesh. And they believe when they stand before God, they're going to reap great rewards in heaven for all the work they've done. And God's going to stand there and say, you know, all that matters to me is what I'm doing. And you weren't part of what I was doing. You weren't acting according to my mandate. You weren't acting according to my leading. You weren't doing what I asked you to do. What you did was on your own. Where you were trying to build a church, I didn't tell you to build a church there. I didn't ask you to do that. So therefore, everything that you've done there is invisible to me. I don't even see it. How is it that God could look Abraham in the eye and say, Abraham... Take Isaac, thine only son. Obviously, Ishmael did not even exist to God. Amen. Ishmael did not even exist in God's eyes. And we know that in Scripture, Abraham goes to the Lord at one point and said, All oh, that Ishmael would, be, would exist, I'm going to paraphrase, would exist before you. Because he knew that in God's eyes, Ishmael was dead. Ishmael didn't even, he didn't even exist. And Abraham interceded for his 
other son, his eldest son, Ishmael. And God turned around and said, Abraham, I will bless him also, and I will make of him great nation, and I will do great things for him. And God gave a great promise concerning Ishmael. But as Abraham is being ordered to take Isaac to the top of the mountain as a sacrifice, Ishmael is not even in the picture. God doesn't even see it. You know, there's an old saying I remember as a kid. I'll never forget it because I think it was a beautiful saying. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. All that matters, Mother, in this life is what God wants us to do. We can do all kinds of things on God's behalf. We can do all kinds of things for God. We can do all kinds of things in the name of God. Remember Jesus said, many will come before me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have I not cast out devils? Have we not uh, prayed for the sick and seen them healed? Haven't we done all these things in your name? And the Lord will say, sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Because when you're not acting in the will of God, it's the same as acting in sin. Hello now. My Lord, have mercy. That's a scary thought, isn't it? When you're not acting according to the perfect will of God, it is the same as acting in sin. You might as well be out in the bar room. You might as well be out in the whorehouse. You might as well be out getting high if you're not acting in the will of God. Because God sees action that is born of unbelief. He sees action that is born of the flesh the same way he saw Ishmael. Didn't exist. Didn't exist to him. But when the Lord says, some will cry unto me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this? Have we not done that? Look at how the Lord labeled them. He said, ah, depart from me. What? Ye workers of iniquity. You mean casting out demons? I was a worker of iniquity? You mean preaching the gospel? I was a worker of iniquity. Do you mean uh, laying hands upon the sick and seeing them recover? I was a worker of iniquity. Yes, you were, if you were not in the will and plan of God. My Lord, have mercy. Now, isn't that something? See, we've got people, I've been saying this for weeks and months and years now, we've got people that God has spoken to, to come to the city of Dallas to be a part of this church, and not a one of them so far has come. And do you know this morning that every single one of them is literally, in the eyes of God, living in sin where they are right now? Amen. Because they're not doing what God has asked them to do. They're not going, they're not being where God wants them to be. You see, my friend, let me tell you, God doesn't look at the picture in the short term. God looks at the picture in the eternal term. You want to talk about looking at something through uh, the long term? You want to talk about being able to look down the road and see what's going to happen a hundred years or a thousand years? God looks at the picture in terms of eternity. So while we in our finite lives are sitting here saying, well, I think I'd be more comfortable and I'd be more happy because I met somebody so I can move off to this city and have my little relationship and I'll be more happy here. And this one says, well, I don't know if I would be comfortable in that city. I don't know if I could find a job in that city, even though God has called me there. Honey, if God has called you there, if God said Abraham uh, to Abraham that uh, Sarah will have a child, then it's going to happen happen. If God's called you here, he's not going to call you here to let you hang. He's not going to call you here and then fail you once you get here. God don't work that way. When I came to Texas as a teenager back in 1982, I was terrified because I never had to live by faith before. I'd never... the. I heard the concepts, but I did not experience it for myself. But I want to tell you, God never left this 16-year-old, 17-year-old boy hanging. He made a way for me where there was no way. And on time after time after time after time after time, God gave me miracle after miracle after miracle. And now I have a story to tell. Now I have a testimony. Now I have a ministry. Why? Because I didn't just hear about something. And I've lived it. We look at things in the temporal. And God looks at the eternal. 
And God is in heaven saying, I've called all these people to come to Texas because once they get there, I'm going to set that group of people on fire. They're going to love one another. They're going to support one another. They're going to believe this great Jesus name message. And they're going to work themselves to death preaching it and proclaiming it and bringing it to that community. And because there's a group of 15 or 20 people who are on fire for God and who all have the same goal and the same interest and the same desire and the same dream, he says, I'm going to cause a spirit of revival to fall on that community like they have never seen in their lives before. And then the locals are going to begin to pour in like water coming over the low end of the dam. Amen. And God says, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm wanting to do. And for all we know, Dallas, Texas may be tomorrow's Azusa Street that will go down in history as the beginning place of a revival that rocked the world. But where are the people? that God has said to be here. Where are the people that God wants to include in that plan? Well, Brother Morrow, if they don't come, God can send somebody else. Well, now that would be right if there was such a thing as the permissive will of God. But there isn't. There's a reason God wants these people that he wants here to be here. It may very well be that they are in a place today that tomorrow is going to be struck by calamity, and if they stay there, their lives will end. It may very well be that he wants them here because where they are at today, there is no spiritual food available to them. And before too long, they're going to starve to death, needing spiritual food that they cannot get. And therefore, God knows where He wants them. He knows where they can be spiritually healthy and well. He knows where they can be physically safe and secure. He knows all these things. We don't. And yet we still have the audacity to rely upon our own thinking in our own minds and our own carnality to determine what choices we ought to make in life rather than lean on the direction of the Holy Ghost. Mm -mm -mm. You know, Abraham had chosen to follow the custom of his time. When he took his wife's handmaiden, Hagar, that wasn't a new idea. That was common. If a woman had gone through her life and had not born any children, it was very common for her to say to her husband, go ahead and take one of my handmaidens, take one of these young ladies, and have a child with her so that you will have offspring, so that your name can continue. It was very common. Abraham didn't do anything uncommon. He didn't do anything exceedingly sinful or out of the ordinary. No, he did what so many had done before him. But the reality is God still had other plans for him. I'm going to tell you, you can go to medical school and spend eight years in medical school if you want to. You can go to law school and spend year after year in law school if you want to. But when God calls you to preach, baby, guess what? God expects you to preach. I've known a lot of preachers in my life who started out their journey in life doing something else. They studied for something else. They prepared for something else. But when the word of the Lord came down to them and said, I want you to preach, then they gave up all that they had prepared for and they began to do what God had called them to do because they understood all that matters is the will of God in my life. That's all that matters. Because if I continue as a doctor, if I continue as a lawyer, God won't see a thing I do. I can give millions to the church. I can go out and witness every weekend. I can pass out tracts till I pass out. But the reality is, if I'm not in the will of God, if I'm not doing what God wants me to do, then God doesn't see a thing that I'm doing. 
And so far as he is concerned, I'm doing the same thing all the other sinners are doing. Because if I'm not on the right path, I have to be on the wrong one. Am I right? Now listen to this today. God always keeps his promises. Abraham decided to take her, uh, Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, and have a child with her because apparently Sarah was barren. But God made a promise, and God always keeps his promises. For Abraham, his actions with Hagar were meaningless to God. Your actions, your conduct, your behavior outside of the will of God for your life is meaningless to God. Do you hear me now? Everything we do in unbelief, everything we do uh, in our own carnality is meaningless to God. All that matters is what God has spoken. All that matters is what God desires for our life. All that matters is the will of God for us. In Genesis chapter 16... Verses 1 through 3, we read, Now Sarah, uh, Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaiden, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai went unto Abraham, uh, Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my, my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai, and Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. The only things we give birth to in this life that count before God are those things which are born of faith and obedience. Now, did you hear that statement? The only things we give birth to. Birth is not an easy process. It's even harder when you're 90 years old trying to have a baby. But you see, not everything God wants for us is going to come easy. Hello now. Not everything God wants for us is going to come easy. But the only things that are going to count with God are the things that are born of faith and obedience. So they may not be easy, but they're the only things that will count. The Lord does not accept our seconds and then just adjust his will to fit our compromises. Had he done so, he might simply have allowed Ishmael to become heir to the promise which he had made to Abraham. But God did not want Egyptian blood in the lineage of Abraham's seed. For he had a far greater purpose in mind and a much greater plan. That plan being, Abraham, it's out of your seed that Messiah will come. It's out of your seed that Messiah will come. And I want your seed to be pure. And I want your seed not to be polluted by that of the idol-worshipping Egyptians. I want the two people on the face of this earth who embrace one God, who know that I am the Almighty God and beside me there is no other. I want those two people to be the foundation for a nation that I will create out of which Messiah will come. So see, Hagar could have never produced that for Abraham. Ishmael could never have been that for Abraham. And isn't it interesting that as we look at the Jewish faith, how is a child determined to be Jew or not through the lineage of the mother? It's not through the father. It's through the mother. Therefore, it had to be Sarah. You don't know why God wants you where he wants you today. You don't understand why God is beckoning you to go where he's calling you to go. It's not up to you to know today why. He's looking at eternity. Somebody will miss heaven if you don't go. Somebody will make heaven if you do. Amen. Somebody's going to be shouting around the throne of God through eternity if you'll obey the voice of God and go. But at the same time, they'll be screaming from the depths of hell through eternity if you don't. Change 
Children, this is a much more important matter than we can ever imagine. It's time for the people of God universal to begin to walk and live and act in faith and in obedience and allow the Spirit of Almighty God to lead us and guide us. We are headed for the tribulation period. We are headed for a difficult time. If God is telling you to go somewhere, there is a reason He wants you to go. How often do we, through disobedience and unbelief, destroy the work and plan of God? You see, it's, it's so simple to say, it's my life. It's my life. I can make the decisions. I can make the choices I need to make. I can make the decisions I want to make. It may be your life today, but children, it's God's eternal plan as well which will affect many, 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 long after you and I are gone. Amen. So you see, when God calls us and he tries to give us direction and tell us where to go and what to do and how to do it, he knows what he's talking about because he's not looking at your life today. He's looking at eternity. He's looking at how your obedience and your faith can affect eternity and help people make heaven that otherwise might not ever make it. So we need to understand this morning all that matters before the Lord is what God has spoken. He said, I'm going to give you, Abraham, a son, and I'm going to give it through, it, through Sarah. And then, Abraham, as I speak to you about that boy, guess what? He's the only boy I see because I'm not even looking at Ishmael. Everything you've done in the past, everything you've done in the flesh, everything you've done of yourself, everything you've done in unbelief, everything you've done in disobedience, I can't even see it. It's invisible to me. All I can see is when my people walk in the path of righteousness for my name's sake, when they walk in the right path, when they allow me to lead them in the right way to go. That's all I can see. Everything else to me is a blur. I don't know about you, but I want my life to be visible to God. Amen. I want the Lord to be able to see all that I've done. I want him to be able to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. I don't want him to look and say, Go away, you worker of iniquity. All that matters this morning is what God has called us to do. All that matters is the will of God for our lives. All that matters is what God has spoken. Would you stand with me today? Amen. If you can. Tommy, you don't have to if you don't want to. Master, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for this word of encouragement, Lord, that would encourage us today to seek the will of God and to find the will of God. Lord, it's one thing to ask for you to speak. It's another thing for us to sit silently for a moment and listen for the answer. Help us, God, today to learn how to walk in your divine will and your divine statutes. Help us, Lord, to walk in your perfect plan. <clears throat> for, God, we understand today that our life today is but a vapor of smoke. But, God, eternity awaits not only us but all of those around us. And God, if we'll act in faith and obedience, if we'll do that which matters, that which you have spoken, that which you have willed for our lives, then, Lord, our lives might affect others in a positive way, and we might have some part in bringing some soul to Christ that otherwise might never have known you. Jesus, today, as we come before you, God, I come against the very gates of hell that have been uh, trying to raise themselves up against this church and this ministry for year after year after year. And God, we curse the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ, and we claim victory in the name of the Lord. God, you're able this hour to send us souls that need to be saved. You're able to send us souls, God, that need to be lifted up and encouraged. You're able, God, to send us those this hour who have not really heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, who all they know is, is the uh, doubt-filled, negative, condemnatory message that so many preach. <clears throat> 
But Master, today we're just asking you, Lord, help us to be effective. Help us to break through the barrier. Every demon power from hell, in the name of Jesus, we curse it, God. In the name of the Lord, we bind the enemy. Lord, we tear down the strong man in this city and in the city of Dallas. And God, the strong man that would stand over the GLBT community in these places. In the name of Jesus, we bind that enemy according to the word of God. You said, Lord, whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And Master, this hour we loose the armies of God. We loose the angels of God right now in the name of Jesus to go forth into these communities. God, to stir people up to come to be a part of the work of God, to be a part of what God is doing in this place. God, send your angels this hour to remind every single one of those that you have spoken to throughout this country to come and be a part of this work. And God, let your angels torment them until they obey the voice of God, until this thing is done, until God's people are where they're meant to be so that you can do what you desire to do. God, if it were so easy today for someone else to do our job, then why could you not have sent someone else to Nineveh rather than insist that Jonah go there? But Lord, you insisted that Jonah go because it was Jonah's job. And Lord, today there are so many that need to be here who are supposed to be here, but they are bucking the Spirit of God. And Lord, as you spoke to Saul on the road to Damascus, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? Isn't it difficult for them, God, to kick against your will? Isn't it difficult, God, for them to kick against the plan of God for their life? Oh, Lord Jesus, open up eternity in our eyes this morning. Open up eternity, Lord, that we can see your divine plan. Help us, God, today to get a vision. For the Word of God declares, without a vision, the people perish. Help us to see, Lord, what you desire to do. Help us to see, Lord, how you want to use us. Help us to see, God, how you want to do great things. For your name's sake and for your glory, as we approach the very end of these last days. Master, today prepare us, make us ready. Help us, God, at the hour of the trump to be ready, God, to go up at the first call. Master, today in Jesus' name, help us to know all that matters is your will for our lives. All that matters is what you have spoken. Grant it, we pray this hour, for we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. God bless you this morning.